from John's Gospel, very much similar to the story we read last week about John the baptizer in the wilderness. We begin with verses 6 through 8, and then we're going to skip down to verses 19 through 28. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify to the light so that all might believe through him. He himself was not the light, but he came to testify to the light. This is the testimony given by John when Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who are you? He confessed, and he did not deny it, but confessed, I am not the Messiah. And they asked him, What then? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? He answered, No. Then they said to him, Who are you? Let us have an answer for those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? He said, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. Now they had been sent from the Pharisees. They asked him, Why then are you baptizing if you are neither the Messiah nor Elijah nor the prophet? John answered them, I baptize with water. Among you stands one whom you do not know, the one who is coming after me. I am not worthy to untie the thong of his sandal. This took place in Bethany across the Jordan, where John was baptizing. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, I get to learn how to preach again a different way all over again. Now I'm looking at the camera instead of looking at people. Uh, We had this for a while back in the, the colder weather, the colder months of the year when COVID began and we started doing remote worship. And then we were outside for a while and I got to look at the camera and over the camera at the people in the cars. Then we were back in here for a few lovely weeks with the camera and people spread out through the sanctuary and now we're back to the camera. Very strange way to preach when you're not used to doing that. So please forgive me if I'm a little halting this morning because I have a lot of things to keep in my head and if I look down, I'm lost. I want to tell you a story about one of my early years in West Virginia. I think it was my first year. I was asked to do a graveside funeral service, no church service at all. And I was given the name of a church. I was told to go to the Pleasant View Church. Couldn't find it online, couldn't find it on a map. In those days, we looked at maps. Couldn't find it anywhere. But the funeral director said, don't worry, I've written down directions for you. So I got into the car and I unfolded the paper and it was take Route 9 to this road without a sign on it, make a right turn there, follow the road that looks like you're chasing a rabbit, and then when you come to the Y, go straight. Well, I am from the suburbs. I have never chased a rabbit. And if you go to a Y and you go straight, you're in trouble. And I looked and I looked and I couldn't find anything. And finally, I stopped and I asked a man who then went into his house and came out with a gun that he pointed at me. I got in the car and drove away very quickly. So I finally found two little girls out playing in the snow, which was falling steadily that day. And I said to them, is there a church around here? They said, there are a lot of churches, lady. What church are you looking for? I said, is it a United Methodist Church? Is it called Pleasant View? And they said, no. But there is a church that has a cross with a red scarf on it. I said, that's the one. And they they pointed me in the direction. And I found the church, which was not called Pleasant View. It was called Salem United Methodist Church in a community unincorporated, known to those who lived right around there as Pleasant View. Shouldn't have been surprised because people kept giving me directions saying, go to the high store and turn right. I couldn't find the high store. I said to somebody, where's Highs? And they said, it's right across the street from your house. I said, that's 7-Eleven. They said, oh, it used to be Highs. You've got to be careful when you're giving directions, don't you? And some people don't like to ask for directions at all. Some people prefer to read a map. And if you prefer to read a map in these days, you are lost completely because there is no such thing as a map anymore, it seems. Back in the olden days, you could go to any gas station along the highway and ask for a map. They were given out for free. Then you'd get in the car with the map, and your mother would try to read it while your father yelled and drove. At least that's how it happened in my family. Now it's all GPS. We have lots of people telling us where to go. The first GPS I had was built into my car. It wasn't Siri or um, even my Garmin that I got later. But it was one that was built into the car, and I used to trust it until the day I was on the Washington Beltway, and she said to me, make a U-turn now passenger in the car that day said, oh, please, if you ever don't listen to this, don't listen to it now. We're called to be those who point the way to others. Last week, I talked about paving the way. 
This week we're talking about pointing the way, pointing the way to Jesus. Sometimes you don't know where you're going ahead unless you remember where you've been. That's what we've been reading this morning from the Hebrew Scriptures, both from the psalm that we began with. When the Lord restored our fortunes, we were like those who dream. It was like waking up from a nightmare into a dream of glory and wonder. Talking about the watercourses of the Negev, that was when, for part of the year, no water flowed. But then that glorious time came when the waters flowed again and watered the ground around there. And it was like life was beginning all over again. Sort of the same thing that we get from the Isaiah passage. We've been reading in Isaiah, which we do every year before Christmas, it seems. Isaiah, who prophesied the exile to Babylon, then talked about restoration. This is one of those passages that happens after they've been restored. But they've gone back home, and home is unrecognizable because it seems like everything has been destroyed and everything is just desolate and such a mess. Sort of like the life we're living right now when we look at the number of people who are sick, when we look at not being able to go outside without a mask on, when we look at an empty church because we can't safely gather for worship, we look at the economy and the businesses that are closing. Restaurants have closed again in Baltimore City and probably will with in the next few weeks in the rest of the state as those numbers continue to climb and climb and climb following Thanksgiving where folks did not want to do what was right and what was expected and what they were told to do because they missed too much the life that they had left behind, sort of like the ancient Israelites. But the passage we read this morning points forward. It points to the time of the servant that Isaiah wrote about, unknown to the people of the time, but looking back, we see that it was Jesus. This is the very passage that Jesus read when he went to the temple in the Gospel of Luke. And he unrolled the scroll of Isaiah to this very passage. And he stood there and he said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because I have been anointed to preach good news to the poor, recovery of sight to the blind, release to the captives, to set at liberty those who are oppressed. And my favorite of the promises is to bind up the brokenhearted. And Isaiah goes on to say, after Jesus has finished rolling up the scroll and saying, Today this has been fulfilled in your hearing, Isaiah went on in the passage that Jerry read this morning, the longer version, it talks about how we, Zion, the people of God, are the ones who are going to be doing the rebuilding. And just the same way that John the Baptist is pointing to the past when they say, who are you? If you're not Elijah, if you're not a prophet, the prophet. If you're not the Messiah, who are you? And he says, the passage that we read from the Hebrew Bible last week, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness from the 40th chapter of Isaiah, to make straight the way for God. Now, what we didn't read this morning, I think, is the heart of the passage from John. I don't know why the lectionary cut off the last two verses. But this is what ends the passage that we read today. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and declared, Here is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes the man who ranks ahead of me, because he was before me. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So many people in today's world don't know who Christ is. They don't know Jesus. They don't know the stories. I remember years ago when I served in deaf ministry, and I was also serving as a chaplain at St. Elizabeth's Hospital, which was then a federal psychiatric hospital, and I worked in the deaf unit. And one of the jobs of a chaplain in a federal hospital was to determine a person's religious background in order to determine their needs, sort of looking back to look forward, as I said. There was a man who had come into the hospital the week that we put everybody on a bus and took them to my deaf congregation, where they shared in a worship service and then a fellowship meal afterwards. And I didn't recognize one of the patients, and I knew them all very well. Even the Jewish patients came along that day and the Catholic patients, because they all knew who I was, and they all had permission to come. We had a glorious worship service, and I saw this man just sitting there clapping and smiling. And then when I went into the hospital the next week, I said, did you enjoy worship? Did you, en did you enjoy church? And he said, yes, yes, loved church. And I said, have you been in a church before? And he said, never, first time. And then I said to him, you've never been in a church before? No, no, never, first time. And I said, well, what do you think about God? And he said, I don't know what that word is. 
I finger spelled G-O-D, I finger spelled J-E-S-U-S, and he said, no idea who that is. No one had ever told him about Jesus Christ before, but he loved the church. It might have been signing music, it might have been the welcome that he received, it might have been the meal that he shared, but all those things point to Christ, point to wholeness and health, point to the hope that is ours. So today, what we need to work on is becoming better pointers. Don't listen to the people who say it's not polite to point, because if you're pointing people toward their God and their Savior in Jesus Christ, you are doing them a great service. One of the ways that we point to Christ is by the way we conduct ourselves in the world, and especially in this time of crisis. Now, lots of folks are experiencing despair. They're experiencing just feelings of loss and hurt and grief and sorrow. If you are really struggling right now, I'm not talking to you, but I'm talking to those who might just be like me, whining a little bit sometimes over the way things are or the way things cannot be right now. If that is what we're doing, then we need to remember the hope that is ours in Christ Jesus. We need to remember our call to joy. Joy, not happiness. Let me tell you what I did this week. I sent a happy birthday message to someone that I don't know well, but who is on my friend list on Facebook. Now, please, if I've neglected your birthday, don't, don't get mad at me, because I only do it if I'm thinking of it, and it pops up, and it says, so-and-so's birthday, it's today, and if I'm not in the middle of something else, I'll just send him a happy birthday message. I sent a really silly message to a man that I met on my retreat that I go to in the Adirondacks most summers when I'm able to. We just sort of clicked, and we kept up talking to each other on Facebook, and he posts some of the funniest things I've ever seen. So I sent him a very silly, happy, 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 happy message for his birthday, not knowing that his wife had died that day. When I found that out, I sent him a message, and I said, I am so sorry. I wasn't trying to be insensitive. I didn't know. He wrote back, and he said, actually, I needed something to make me smile, and that did make me smile on the worst day of my life. Happiness is something that is totally dependent on what is happening to you at the moment. Joy is not dependent on happening, what's happening around you. Joy is the presence of God in your life. Joy is the promise of hope in your life. Joy is what keeps you going no matter what else is going wrong around you because joy is part of who we are. Joy is God's abiding love shed to us in Jesus Christ the light at the end of the tunnel. Joy is the promise and the hope, which is why even in the passage that we read from Thessalonians this morning, a time of great persecution of God's people, what is the message? Rejoice always, giving thanks to God, because this is your Christ's will for you. And so we are called to rejoice. We are called to share the good news, because that points people toward God. And if someone says to you, why are you so filled with joy, you can say to them, because no matter what I've lost in this pandemic, I have my God and my Savior. Another way to show joy and to point to Christ is the things that we do in mission, supporting Anna and Nathan Glenn, supporting Abigail McGuckin in their work in other parts of the world, but remembering the Cockeysville Food Bank, and you can, remembering those at Christmas who will not have anything to open for their children that morning, if not for us, or enough food on their table. We are the light shining in darkness, which is our way of pointing the way to Jesus Christ. So if someone says to you, who are you? You can say to them, I am the one who has been saved by the love and the grace of Jesus Christ. Telling somebody else to get their life together and get themselves in order and clean themselves up is not any way to point to Jesus Christ, but saying to them, I was a mess. I was lost. I had no hope. I had no joy until my Savior's love came to me, and now all I can do is share that with you. So this morning, remember that you're not just called to pave the way. You're called to point the way for others to say, behold, here is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. That sounds a little, little theological, a little biblical, a little too weird for people who don't understand the scriptures. But say to them, here is the one who found me at my worst, accepted me and loved me, 
and healed me and made me whole. Then you will point people to their Christ, and then you will have cause to rejoice. Through the glory of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, thanks be to God. Amen.